that has been given to me is to say something about liturgical music or sacred music and when I considered how to approach that it seemed to me that the best place to start would be with the uh, document from the Second Vatican Council on sacred music, Sacrosanum Concilium. There are ten paragraphs that deal with sacred music and it would be useful for us to look at that together. However, by way of introduction, uh, if you consider your experience in, in various parishes or various religious communities in terms of sacred music or liturgical music, uh, we can perhaps identify two contrasting styles. One style I would call the classical style where the liturgy is celebrated with decorum and recollection and reverence, with ceremonial, with uh, vestments that are beautiful, with beautiful architecture like this church, uh, and with sacred music, that is Gregorian chant, polyphony, organ, other instruments, that is the classical repertoire in continuity with the tradition. So I would call that the classical style. We also experience what I will call the modern style, which is uh, more informal in nature, frequently enough um, not giving much attention to sacred vestments. Uh, certainly we've seen modern churches, that is arch modern architecture, which is sometimes disorienting uh, and on purpose. And with this uh, stereotype that I'm drawing here, there's also a different kind of music that is a more contemporary kind of music, which doesn't make a distinction between sacred music and the music that you would hear in the popular culture. In fact, this, uh, this uh, more contemporary music is often hostile to the traditional repertoire. Now the problem is that both of these two styles, the classical style and the modern style, cite the council to justify uh, their choices. Therefore, we need to take a better look at what the council says to try and figure out this dilemma. Uh, before we begin with paragraph 112, uh, we need to say something about how to read the Council, that is the hermeneutic of the Council. And Pope Benedict XVI uh, rendered the service, uh, rendered the church an enormous service uh, in December of 2005, uh, when he, in, in his uh, uh, address to the Cardinals before uh, Christmas time, described two approaches for interpreting the Council. I'm simplifying now for the sake of brevity. Uh, one approach is continuity with the tradition, and the other approach is rupture with the tradition. So we can read the Council according, depending on the glasses that you use, either according to this continuity with the tradition or rupture with the tradition. Let's take a look at these 10 paragraphs, applying both of those glasses, that is both the glasses of continuity and the glasses of rupture, and see, see, what, see where we come out. So we begin with uh, paragraph 112. The musical tradition of the universal church is a treasure of immeasurable value, greater even than that of any other art. The main reason for this for this preeminence, is that as sacred melody is united to words, it forms a necessary or integral part of the solemn liturgy. Now, when it talks about the solemn liturgy, it's referring to categories uh, that were uh, common in 1963, 
that is, the, the three types of celebration, that is the low mass, the misa cantata, and the solemn mass. So when it talks about the solemn liturgy here, it's referring to that uh, uh, most complete form of the Eucharistic celebration in this period of time, with the, with the priest and the deacon and the subdeacon and all the uh, sacred ministers and the music which must be sung. In the solemn mass, you can't have spoken parts. Uh, that, that is, it's required that certain things be sung. So the, in this solemn form of the liturgy, um, the sacred melody is intimately tied to the words, and therefore it becomes an integral part of the solemn liturgy. Uh, let's just look at that uh, initial affirmation according to the principle of continuity. The tr musical tradition of the church is emphasized here. And if you look at the second paragraph, uh, there's explicit reference to St. Pius X and general reference to Roman pontiffs, other Roman pontiffs. Well, in order to interpret this document in terms of continuity with what went before, you need to refer to Pius X and the document Trale Solicitudini, 1903, uh, and Pius XII, who wrote an encyclical on sacred music, in 1955. In 1958, the Congregation of Rites came out with an instruction to elaborate on Pius XII's uh, encyclical on sacred music. This uh, document of the Second Vatican Council is from 1963. So if Pius XII wrote in 1955, and if there's an instruction in 58, uh, we're only a, a short period of time uh, between these various documents of the magisterium. And therefore, the point of reference for, for this text is what went before. It's important that St. Pius X is best known, well, for two things in terms of sacred music. He uses the phrase active participation in 1903, and what he means by that is that the people sing the ordinary parts of the Mass. But he also uh, defines uh, what sacred music means, and he gives it three characteristics. He says, first of all, it has to be holy. That is, a kind of music that you don't hear in the streets, uh, a music that is exclusive or reserved to the sacred mysteries. The second characteristic is that it has to be genuine art. You can't have sloppy music uh, and call it sacred music. It has to be genuine uh, art. And the third characteristic is universality. Uh, the church being spread throughout the entire world has a certain tradition and repertoire, uh, and if that is promoted everywhere, then the, the sense of belonging to the whole church, the universal church, is much more, uh, much more real. Look at the last paragraph in 112. It says, this sacred council keeping to the norms and precepts of ecclesiastical tradition and discipline, and having regard for the purpose of sacred music, which is the glory of God and the sanctification of the faithful, decrees as follows. So the council wants to keep to the norms and precepts of the tradition. This first paragraph can be interpreted very easily in continuity with the tradition. What about the eyeglasses of discontinuity? Well, that school of thought would say that it's necessary to go beyond the text and that this musical tradition and its patrimony uh, is no longer uh, valid because it doesn't favor the active participation of the faithful. Therefore, new forms are necessary and uh, it's necessary to break with the past. And we'll see later on in the text uh, more um, motivation for this point of view. Let's pass on to uh, paragraph 113. 
Liturgical action is given a more noble form when the sacred rites are solemnized in song. With the assistance of sacred ministers and the active participation of the people. Once again, the reference is to a Misa Cantata, or a solemn high mass, as opposed to a low mass. So liturgical action is given a more noble form when it's not a low mass, but when the sacred rites are solemnized in song, a Misa Cantata, with the assistance of sacred ministers, a solemn high mass, and the active participation of the people we'll see that the key to this, uh, uh, this dilemma is how to understand active participation. Then it talks about the language to be used. And uh, it simply makes a reference to previous uh, articles of Sacrosanctum Concilium. So let's take a look at uh, Article 54, which talks about the language to be used for Mass. Paragraph 54 says, in Masses which are celebrated with the people, a suitable place may be allotted to their mother tongue. So this is something new with the Council. This provision is to apply in the first place to the readings and the universal prayer, that is the prayer of the faithful but also, as local conditions may warrant, to those parts which pertain to the people. Nevertheless, steps should be taken so that the faithful may also be able to say or to sing together in Latin those parts of the ordinary of the Mass which pertain to them. So the uh, Council document on the liturgy is promoting uh, a balance between retaining uh, Latin as the official language of the liturgy and opening up the possibility for a limited use of the vernacular, especially in terms of the readings. Now, how to interpret this in terms of continuity or discontinuity? Uh, let me just take a moment to, to talk about the active participation of the people. There's a description in another document of 1967 which describes the participation of the faithful. This is a document called Musicam Sacram, uh, issued by the Congregation for, uh, for Sacraments as a way to interpret Sacrosanctum Concilium. Let me find the exact text for you. The faithful fulfill their liturgical role by full, conscious, and active participation, which is demanded by the nature of the liturgy itself, and which is, by reason of baptism, the right and duty of the Christian people. This participation, A, should be, above all, internal, in the sense that by it, the faithful join their mind to what they pronounce or hear, and cooperate with heavenly grace. That's the first meaning of active participation, internal. B, this part participation must be external also, that is, to show the internal participation by gestures and bodily attitudes, by acclamations, responses, and singing. The faithful should also be taught to unite themselves interiorly to what the ministers or choir sing, so that by listening to them, they may raise their minds to God. So listening is a form of active participation. This, this document, once again, is uh, 1967, so four years after Sacrosanctum Concilium as a official interpretation of the text. So when we want to know what active participation means, there are, there are official documents which uh, elaborate on that topic. Back to Sacrosanctum Concilium. How can we interpret paragraph 113 in terms of continuity? <clears throat> 
Well, the ideal presented is a liturgy celebrated solemnly uh, with, with chant, with sacred ministers, and with the active participation of the people, internal as well as external, listening as well as doing. So that certainly is in continuity with everything that Pius X was uh, working for and up through um, the century uh, to Pius XI and Pius XII and the Second Vatican Council. Now the principle of discontinuity would be that the active participation of the faithful requires that the songs be all in the vernacular because we saw that second part of the paragraph on the use of Latin in the vernacular in the liturgy. The principle of discontinuity would say that the insistence on uh, knowing the ordinary of the Mass in Latin was a compromise uh, text in the document and soon uh, taken over by a different praxis. So we shouldn't pay attention to what the text says, but rather to what its spirit indicates. In addition, uh, another, the, the same paragraph 54 that I cited about uh, Latin or the vernacular, it says, if in some places it seems opportune to use a pew to have a pure extended use of the vernacular in the Mass, they're thinking of mission uh, territory, uh, that those permissions have to go through the competent ecclesiastical authority. Now here's something to think about. If in terms of missionary countries there was this openness to a greater use of the vernacular to correspond to the culture of the people, what about the culture of the European people? Um, it seems to me, if we're objective, that the Latin language is part and parcel, parcel of the European culture. Uh, it used to be very common in schools, uh, although uh, much less so nowadays, I imagine. Uh, but one way of, um, of enriching or of retrieving our own culture, our, our European culture and heritage, is also the use of Latin. Let's go to 114. The treasure of sacred music is to be preserved and fostered with very great care. So we're referring to a, a, um, a patrimony here, a repertoire. Choirs must be diligently promoted, especially in cathedral churches, so the, the, uh, the choir has a, a fundamental role to play. But bishops and other pastors of souls must be at pains to ensure that whenever the sacred action is to be celebrated with song, the whole body of the faithful may be able to contribute that active participation which is rightly theirs. So here we have the problem of choirs and active participation. How to interpret that in the sense of continuity. Well, um, Pius XII, uh, already in um, 1955, and in the document that came out um, later, in 1958, described three degrees of um, musical participation. The first degree is the dialogue that is to be sung, is the dialogue between priest and people. So, in nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Amen. That's, that kind of dialogue throughout the whole of the Mass is the first degree of participation. Now, if the priest can't sing, then we've got a problem. Uh, so we tend not to observe this first degree of uh, participation because uh, many priests don't sing. 
Now, if you ever go to a Byzantine uh, liturgy, it's impossible that a priest be ordained if he can't sing, or at least uh, kind of difficult. Um, perhaps we should pay a little bit more attention to the, uh, the training of people in the seminary. Anyway, that's the first degree. The second degree of uh, musical participation is the ordinary of the Mass. That is the, the, the Kyrie, the Gloria, the, um, the Credo, the Sanctus, the Agnus Dei, uh, those parts of the Mass that are sung, that are the, the, they're the same every, every Sunday. So uh, one of the things that Pius X wanted to do in 1903 was to ensure that, uh, that people were trained to sing the ordinary parts of the Mass. The third degree is much more uh, difficult, that is the propers of the Mass in, in Gregorian chant, because they require a certain level of musical preparation and therefore tend to be uh, out of the reach of a, of a general uh, congregation. But if the priest and the people are singing the responses, and if the people are singing the ordinary parts of the Mass, and if there's a scola that is proficient in the propers of the Mass, then we can participate by listening. Uh, and uh, if, if you only had the opportunity to spend an, an entire year listening to the repertoire of the, the chant repertoire, uh, you, you would, uh, it would sink into your bones and you'd see how really, how really beautiful it is. Uh, you don't have to sing everything, uh, but uh, you can participate also by listening in terms of the propers, because they tend to be rather difficult. So that's how we can uh, deal with this paragraph 114 about the scola cantorum and participation in terms of continuity with the tradition. In terms of discontinuity, uh, the attitude would be that the patrimony of sacred music, not just for chant, but also for polyphony, and the very existence of the Schola Cantorum uh, prevent the participation of the faithful. And therefore, um, that patrimony has to be put aside. Paragraph 115. Great importance is to be attached to the teaching and practice of music in seminaries, in novitiates, in houses of study. Teachers should be carefully trained. It's desirable to found higher institutes of sacred music. Composers and singers, especially boys, here in England you have a marvelous tradition of boy choirs, um, which is the envy of uh, the rest of the world. Um, and the, the document refers to that explicitly. That is, composers and singers, especially boys, must also be given a genuine liturgical training so they understand uh, why they're singing, what they're seeing, singing, and, and uh, what it means in its larger context. So this is a question of formation. In terms of continuity, well, uh, Pius X and Pius XII insisted uh, on this aspect of, of uh, training. So it's certainly in continuity with the past. In terms of discontinuity, uh, this recommendation um, has very rarely been put into effect. Um, because if the ideal is a kind of popular uh, song for mass, then you don't need specialists. And therefore, you don't need to train them, because anyone can do it. So you see that the, the text itself of Sacrosanum Concilium presupposes that sacred music requires formation and training. Number 116. The Church acknowledges Gregorian chant as proper to the Roman liturgy. Therefore, other things being equal, it should be given pride of place in liturgical services other things being equal. What other things? Well, the next paragraph. 
Other kinds of sacred music, especially polyphony, are by no means excluded from liturgical celebrations, so long as they accord with the spirit of the liturgical action. So Gregorian chant and polyphony are being recommended in this paragraph. In terms of continuity with the tradition, it's pretty obvious, uh, Pius X and Pius XII insisted on these things, but you have the great schools of, of polyphony after the, after the Council of Trent, uh, Palestrina and, and the Roman school. Uh, here in England, even before that, you have uh, composers like Orlando di Lasso and people like that, uh, polyphonic masses uh, that, are, that are part of our patrimony. In terms of discontinuity, uh, people would look at the phrase, as long as they accord with the spirit of the liturgical action that I just cited. And the reference to Article 30 is on active participation. So the school of discontinuity would say active participation precludes Gregorian chant and polyphony. Let's go to 117. The typical edition of the books of Gregorian chant is to be completed, and a more critical edition is to be prepared of those books already published since the restoration by St. Pius X. It is desirable also that an edition be prepared containing simpler melodies for use in small churches. Here's a little uh, anecdote that uh, you may have heard before. In 1903, when Pius X published uh, his uh, motu proprio, the state of, um, of the chant was not very coherent at that point. And he asked, uh, that is the, the only edition in existence at that time, it was called the Medici edition, which went back to the, the post-Tridentine uh, period with lots of uh, errors and um, inaccuracies. So Pius X approached the monks of Solem and he said, now how long do you think it would take to produce a new edition of the chant book? And they conferred with one another and they said, well, about 50 years. And he said, well, I'll give you five. And so in 1908, the Graduale Romanum was published. Now, they had to rush and uh, as a result, the work wasn't complete. And that's why this text says, uh, the typical edition is to be completed. It was completed, I think, in 1979 uh, in, the in the new Graduale Romanum. That is based upon chant manuscripts, uh, especially from the, the 10th and 11th centuries. In terms of this, uh, edition of simpler melodies, that's the Graduale Simplex, which was a nice idea um, using kind of psalm tones, um, but it never caught on, uh, and basically, uh, I don't know if it's used anywhere anymore. How do we interpret this paragraph in terms of continuity? Well, the, the monks of Solem did an enormous uh, work to, uh, even before uh, Pius X, uh, and are still working on these things. Uh, so that shows the continuity of perseverance, certainly, in, um, in preparing very carefully the, the, this liturgical book, the official uh, a songbook of the church. In terms of discontinuity, uh, the point of view would be that it, it doesn't make any sense to dedicate too many resources to such things because it's reserved to specialists um, and uh, in fact in most parishes it's simply not, not just not used but not even known. 118. Religious singing by the people is to be skillfully fostered. Now, there's a distinction being made here, not liturgical singing, religious singing. That is, 
not music for the Eucharistic liturgy, but music for devotions, um, uh, other kinds of gatherings, um, but not for, the, not for the Eucharist. Religious singing is to be skillfully fostered so that in devotions and sacred exercises, as also during liturgical services, and I'll tell you what that means, the voices of the faithful may ring out according to the norms and requirements of the rubrics. Well, in the 1958 document, there's a distinction that for the solemn high mass, religious singing is not permitted. That is, you can't, you, you can't substitute other songs, even religious in nature, for the official texts in a solemn high mass. However, for low mass, it was permitted, this is in 58, to sort of accompany the low mass with religious songs. Uh, in fact, the origin of the four hymn mass comes precisely from that period, 1958, because you had the, the uh, low mass uh, said, uh, said quietly, sotto voce, and so that the people would be able to uh, enter into the spirit of the thing, uh, it was permitted to have hymns. Now it depends on which country you're from, what kind of a, a repertoire of hymns uh, exists. Um, certainly uh, in the Protestant tradition in Germany and in the Anglican tradition in not just Anglican but also Methodist and uh, there's, a, there's a vast kind of repertoire of hymn singing but in the Catholic Church, there, there hasn't been too much of that. Uh, at least, uh, it's not as, not as rich as those other traditions. One of the preoccupations, however, in 1958, was that this religious singing, uh, it has to be vetted, that is, the, the competent authority has to approve of the texts to make sure that they're doctrinally sound. Uh, we'll see that that's an element uh, in this text also. So in terms of uh, 118, uh, popular religious singing, in terms of continuity, we see that Pius XII uh, promoted religious singing also. Not for the, not for the solemn mass, however. Uh, in terms of discontinuity, no, it depends on which country you're, you're living in, but in general, new compositions have substituted uh, the, the older uh, popular religious songs. Certainly, that's the case in Italy, uh, that as people have been singing hymns or popular, popular songs for decades and decades, but uh, now, there, there are new compositions that, that tend to replace uh, not just the classical repertoire, but also the repertoire of religious, popular religious songs. 119. In certain parts of the world, especially mission lands, there are people who have their own musical traditions, and these play a great part in the religious and social life. For this reason, due importance is to be attached to their music and a suitable place is to be given to it, not only by way of forming their attitude toward religion, but also when there is a question of adapting worship to their native genius. Therefore, missionaries should be trained in promoting the traditional music of these peoples. In terms of continuity, uh, Pius XII refers to this need of the mission lands. And in fact, we have some outstanding examples of that that I'm sure you're familiar with. The Jesuit Reducciones in Paraguay and places like that in South America. One of the, one of the tools, one of the key uh, instruments that they used for evangelization was polyphonic music. And the, the indigenous peoples uh, took to that uh, immediately and were able to sing uh, these very complex uh, uh, polyphonic settings 
and uh, that became part of their, their faith identity. Not only in South America, but in Central America, in Mexico, the tradition of, of polyphonic masses uh, was very strong with new compositions, but in, in that uh, post-Tridentin uh, pure style, uh, that is the Palestrina kind of style, so that these mission lands uh, were evangelized to a certain extent by sacred music. Uh, that's that's uh, instructive to us. Now, in terms of discontinuity, the the school of discontinuity would say, well, we need to enculturate in the local scene and not uh, impose Western musical forms on these other peoples. And in fact, the Pontifical Institute of, Music, of Sacred Music in Rome has a whole section on, on missiology, on uh, music for mission lands. Well, there's the difference there, or the contrast between the local church and the universal church, and that's not always easy to, to negotiate. But, as I, just, as I mentioned earlier, if it's useful to uh, cultivate the music of local cultures in the mission lands, wouldn't it be also useful to cultivate uh, musical traditions in Europe? Uh, we have our, our traditions, and it seems silly to just uh, abandon them uh, because in doing so, we abandon also our own past. 120. In the Latin church, the pipe organ is to be held in high esteem, for it is the traditional musical instrument and one that adds a wonderful splendor to the church's ceremonies and powerfully lifts up man's mind to God and to heavenly things. Uh, so there's a strong recommendation of uh, the pipe organ. But other instruments may also be admitted for use in divine worship with the knowledge and consent of the competent territorial authority. This may be done only on condition that the instruments are suitable for sacred use, or can be made so, that they accord with the dignity of the temple and truly contribute to the edification of the faithful. In the 1958 document, Pius XII opened the door for other instruments besides the organ, but he referred explicitly to strings and the violin as being especially suitable, uh, because they often, uh, organ and violin often uh, make music together. There's an example that perhaps you've heard about, about um, a monastery of the Solemn Congregation in Africa I can't remember the country, but the, the custom there is to, um, there's this stringed instrument with a very long neck and a bowl, I guess in the family of a lute or something like that. Um, and the monks there have perfected the use of this local instrument for accompanying the, the chant of the divine office, something very beautiful. Uh, so the, um, the, Interpretation of continuity doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't limit uh, the repertoire to only what has been done in the past. It's also open to the future and to other cultures and other places with certain controls, however, namely that the competent territorial authority uh, supervise these things. The trouble is most bishops are just too busy doing other things to worry about uh, checking the, the, the text of a, uh, of a proposed new hymn or something like that. And therefore, that oversight, that, that, is, um, that supervision has often uh, fallen by the wayside, with the result that uh, we get all kinds of things uh, that are not uh, doctrinally sound. In any case, uh, the organ 
and other instruments are recommended here. In terms of discontinuity, uh, some people would say that the organ um, shouldn't be used very often because the culture of the organ has disappeared and uh, besides it requires a, a professional training and if the goal is more in a more informal style that uh, and uh, people could make music without uh, special training then the guitar would be much more suitable because it's more readily accessible to people. In, uh, in Norcia, the, the town where our monastery is, the, the parish church has a lovely organ in the, in the uh, cantoria, but it's never used. Uh, instead, there's an electrical keyboard that they use uh, for a kind of pop music style. Um, and it seems like a very strange thing if you have this beautiful organ uh, available for you. But a beautiful organ takes skill to play, um, whereas a, a simple keyboard is something accessible to anybody. 121. Composers filled with a Christian spirit should feel that their vocation is to cultivate sacred music and increase its store of treasures. So musicians have a vocation, not simply to uh, safeguard the, the treasure, the, the musica traditio, but to increase it and to uh, develop it. Uh, and therefore, composers in particular are exhorted to produce pieces which have the qualities proper to genuine sacred music. What are those proper qualities? It doesn't say. You have to go back to Pius X. Holy, true art, universal. So, new compositions which have those qualities, not confining themselves to works which can be sung only by large choirs, because what about the small parishes? They don't have the resources for a large choir. But providing also for the needs of small choirs and for the active participation of the entire assembly of the faithful. In the Basilica of San Benedetto, for a while we had a, a small women's choir but they weren't, uh, they weren't mu professional musicians and they had uh, quite a bit of trouble singing anything uh, too complicated. So our choir director wrote music for them just in two voices instead of three or four. And they did fine. So the, the, mu the, the musicians, the, the composers in this case, have to adapt themselves to the resources that they have. Even outstanding musicians like Bach he was a church organist, and he had to write things for his people and what they could do. Um, so the, the text uh, encourages musicians in this regard. The texts, however, intended to be sung must always be in conformity with Catholic doctrine. Indeed, they should be drawn chiefly from Holy Scripture and from liturgical sources. Uh, this is certainly uh, in continuity with, uh, especially with Pius XII and with his um, indications about the, the safeguarding of, of uh, doctrine in the texts to be sung. There, I think I've gone on long enough. There's lots more that could be said. Uh, I think it's important to read this these ten paragraphs of Sacrosanum Concilium in a larger context, uh, in the context of the development of this musical tradition. And I think you can see that uh, while Sacrosanum Concilium opens the door for new expressions, and especially for involving the congregation in a, in a richer, more profound way, it's a, it's a pretty pretty conservative document, um, depending on your criterion for interpretation. Um,